Good morning, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars during the pandemic that I started uh, over three months ago now. And I started them because I couldn't visit my friends, and I thought it'd be a great way to have chats with them and to uh, you know, inc include my education in that process and have some fun. And so this, I think, is number 88 in my webinar series. I had no idea it was going to go on this long. But um, everybody's been giving me such amazing feedback about the webinars, and they're fun. I really enjoy getting to talk to my friends. So we're going to keep going with them. Um, and I have a really special guest coming up for the number 100th webinar that's going to be on September 2nd. So stay tuned for more information on that. Um, and. Um, you can always see all of the webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel, so just remember if you've missed one, you can go back there and you can search for your favorite folks and watch those webinars. Today my guest is Patrick Sinclair. Did I get it? It's a lot. <laughs> yes. Sinclair. You got it. There we go. <laughs> Patrick Sinclair. And he is from the Netherlands and he's a dressage rider and trainer. And I met Patrick about a year year and a half ago now i think not that long ago no. but i've yeah. heard of him for many years from my dear friends jenny spain and melinda Fredrickson. so i thought it'd be a really interesting idea to have patrick with us as a guest today to talk about training to, and using the surefoot pads in training some of his horses so welcome patrick thank you so much for joining me this morning thank you thank you for having me yeah it's really fun um so patrick you know to be honest i really don't know your background um, so one of the things that I use the webinars for is to get to know people better. So kind of how did you get where you are today? Where'd you start? So like you said, I'm, I'm from Holland originally. And um, I've been, I, I was trained there by um, Reen Vanderschaft and I spent a couple of years with George Taylor Rescue. That's basically where my, uh, my real education is coming from. Um, I moved to the United States probably 13 years ago, and um, uh, that was my ex-wife was American, so we decided it was a better um, a better place here to to make a living. In Europe, it's just it's busy. There's a lot of professionals. There's a lot of competition, and um, I'd been coming here for a number of years already teaching clinics, so I established a, a decent client base here already. And um, so, yeah, about 13 years ago, we started our own uh, dressage stable and I brought over a couple horses and a couple suit, uh, suitcases and um, that was pretty much it. And um, yeah, so one of the horses, he, um, he became fairly successful. He, his name was Super Times. Um, that was my first bigger horse, I think, here in the United States. He, uh, he did a lot of small tour uh competitions he won dressage at devon um and since he's been sold uh so that was kind of my first uh horse here in, in the united states as far as a competition horse so, um, Patrick, can i interrupt you a little bit did you did you start out horse crazy like all us girls did did i what did you start out horse crazy like all of us girls did pretty much yeah so um i was i was originally born in a city and um when i was about five years old my family decided to move to a smaller town outside of the city and at first i hated it because there was the smell of manure and the smell of everything and i wanted the smell of cars and the city i'm like this is gross um but then uh, i think i was probably eight years old and my dad took me to a driving competition of all things oh. um he did a lot of uh, um, first aid kind of help at uh, any kind of competition, so soccer games and whatnot. And this weekend it was uh, a driving competition, and he's like, "Oh, this might be good for Patrick to come out in the woods and see the horses and just be, you know, outside." And, and I loved it. There were horses, and I got to drive somebody's horse, and that that was it, pretty much. I'm like, "Wow, these animals are amazing," and. Um, it was a couple months later that there was an open house at a local riding school and I took my first lesson and I was scared shitless to sit on the horse, but <laughs> I still loved it. <laughs> it was like, I don't know what to do, but, um, and, and I've been hooked ever since. 
you know, Holland is so I, different ever, in their um, in in what they have available. And this is one of the things that, for yeah. me, when I go to Europe, the thing that I am most impressed about, and and obviously it's the landmass issue, but Europe has integrated horses into society. In other words, in Holland, there's a riding stable around the corner from from housing developments. And so the availability of riding schools is, it's so immediate, it's so simple. Um, and I think that that's yeah. something, you know, in this country, when I was a little kid, there were hack stables where you could go take pony rides, but there were also mm -hmm. riding stables where you could take lessons. And I took lessons, you know, at a little stable, and then I moved to a big hunter jumper stable a little later on. And, and I think that this is something that's so important um, that they figured out in Europe that we have not really figured out here in the United States to provide that opportunity for children. And, and I'd like you to speak about that a little bit because um, yes, it's a school setting, but it's so important. So like you started out in a, in a school barn, right? Yeah. And they provided yeah. a variety of horses. Yeah. Can you just talk about like how long you rode at that stable and the kind of horses you rode and, and what it, and like when yep. you first. So, so I started when I was about eight and it was one of those places where I just went once a week and it was always in a group setting and it was, uh, uh, it was a stable where I think they have probably, I'm going to say 12 different ponies, maybe a little bit more at times, but about 12 and then about the same amount of horses so the horses were for the for the adults 18 and up uh, ponies were for everybody 18 and under and the ponies came in different sizes from a shetland pony to a to a good sturdy fjord and um and i was kind of in a in a age group and a uh, a height basically that i was put on all of them uh, depending on their character, because some of them were spicier, some of them were just calmer. So they really had a variety of every kind of horse. So by the time that I was, uh, um, I think I rode in those lessons what, until I was about 12 or 13, so four or five years. And I rode pretty much all of them. I was at some point put on every single one of them. Um, they weren't like the school horses I think that we think of here. Like they were, they were not like super on the bit or super uh, dressagey, but they they did a little bit of everything. And if you rode well, they would all go about first level, maybe second level, some of them. So there was enough of a challenge to to yeah to learn how to ride them. And we did uh, it was all in a group setting, so that's of course a little bit limited. Um, the specificity of what you can learn. But then also what is kind of a big thing um, in most of those stables is that there's a boarding stable. So I, I was there every weekend. I was cleaning stalls. I was doing everything. So the boarders there saw me and they started to let me ride their horses a little bit. And those were nicer horses, better trained. And there were also group lessons for the boarders and individual, lesson, individual lessons for the horses. So there was education available besides uh, just the, the school horse group lessons. And that's kind of how I um, rolled into getting better horses. My family never really was into horses, so I never owned a horse until I was 18. Um, but at some point, I think it was 13 or 14, I leased somebody's horse and that started to be my first competition horse. And that was also at that, at that same stable. You know, and this brings so, up such an important point, actually, for me, because when I was a kid and I was riding at these lesson barns, again, there was a variety of horses, and the instructor would watch and see, okay, are you ready for the next level horse? And so, yeah. right from the beginning, you got the experience of being challenged, but never overfaced, and then moved on yeah. to different horses as your skill level improved. And so, by the time, like you say, by the time you were 18, you probably rode at least, you know, like, two dozen different horses and and yeah. it's I kind of equate it to like like renting a car you know if you drive one car all the time and then you have to go somewhere and rent a car I remember the first time I rented a Prius I couldn't start it because I didn't know <laughs> where the start button was right and so if you're if, but it's true if you're always riding one yeah. horse 
and then you go on another horse or you go on vacation somewhere or you like I take people on safari and um, on horseback and so they're looking for the buttons to be in the same place their horse was because they didn't have the range of experience and I and I right. you know this is one of the things when I look at the European system which used to be the American system um, and I look at that across our country because the further west you go the less this type of environment is available because the land mass increases and I think there's a direct correlation between land mass and stables um, for for the general public yeah. Um, we're really missing that piece of education in this country and where I see this the, as a serious problem is with my adult riders that have wanted to ride as children, didn't have that experience, come to it as an adult and then go out to buy a horse because there isn't a place where they can go to a stable and learn on horses that are appropriate to their skill level. Um, yeah. and, and I think that this is a huge failing in our industry in the United States, and I, not that I have a solution for it, because the other thing that I see is that we marginalize horses, at least here on the East Coast, we marginalize the horses to the edges of our, our communities, as opposed to integrate the horses into our communities. Um, and, yeah. and I think that's where Europe is really so far ahead of us, but you were forced into it. Due, I mean, Holland is a tiny little country. I have been there many times. Yeah. The, traffic is horrendous <laughs> um, because there's so many cars and so little space um, but they've also there's done a bikes. Yeah. yeah but they've also done a really good job of saying okay um, this is forest this is community development this is you know um, uh, agricultural development and um, and you are the second, Holland is the second largest food producer after the United States. And when you figure out the land yeah. mass, so you guys are really good at figuring out how to put these things together. Um, and, I, yeah. and I think that that is something that if, you know, if we want horses to, to continue in this country, and it's one of my fears that in my lifetime, I might see that riding horses in the United States becomes a very limited, very elite, and, and very marginalized sport because we're not integrating horses into our society. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the things that they do at, at um, Jenny's, Jenny and Melinda's place is they're close enough to the edges of, of community that they're, they're available to people. Um, but I mean, that's kind of, I, okay, so I've gone on my political rant about horses and marginalizing them in our country. <laughs> um, but it is such a different experience when I go to Europe that um, the, the flip side of that is in our country, horses get turned out more. And in Europe, there's very little yeah. turnout. Again, a space demand. And so how do they just, I know this is kind of a little off topic, but you know, this whole idea of having horses in a more natural environment keeps coming up in a lot of my webinars. So how do they yeah. manage horses over in, in the Netherlands to meet the needs of the horse as, as a herd animal while at the same time integrating it into human society? Like what are right. they Well, I think, I think that's a big topic over there also. And I think more and more stables are uh, trying to have more turnout, uh, whether it's in an actual field or dry lots or whatever. Uh, but the riding school where I was, in, I mean, this is 30 years ago now, we didn't think of turning them out. I mean, once a week, they all the ponies were led into the indoor altogether and got to run around as a group. Um, and the rest of the week, they were in their, in their stands. They didn't even have an actual box stall. They just had stands and they were right. tied up to that. And they were happy. They were, they were fine. And they got few hours of moving around every day because I think all the ponies did at least three lessons a day so they did get to walk around and trot around quite a bit so they they were quite fit but yeah for, as far as as keeping them in a natural way that there, there was a lot to be desired back then and right. um, yeah and I, I think that has changed quite a bit by now I've not been to the Ryan school since I left the country but um, but I know from the boarding stables, because every time I go over there now, I try to teach some of my friends and kind of meet up with them. And most of the boarding stables now have either a group turnout or uh, whatnot. So, so that's a pretty, um, I think a pretty hot topic over there also, and people are trying. 
Right. But sure. you bring up the point that the ponies were working at least three hours a day, which is not, yeah. uh, you know, on a fit horse under instruction, that's not an overly taxing demand. And I think that's right. the flip side that we see here is we might have our horses turned out, but a lot of them are just standing and they're not really yeah. moving, even though they're out in a big field, you know? Um, and so that, that exercise piece that is made up for in lessons, um, just because we turn them out doesn't mean they're moving. I, my horse is a case in point. <laughs> You know, yeah. he stands in the shed because it's 90 degrees and high humidity. And so he's like, I'm just going to stand here. So, um, you know, he might as well be in a box at the amount of time he's spending in his shed in this. It's been pretty miserable this summer. Um, but, you know, that's the trade off. And, and I think that it's important because I get some people that are like, you know, all horses need to be turned out or all horses should be. And. And the key, I think, is to keep looking at the environment that we have and the value of that. Like. Um, and many places are like, you know, we shouldn't have horses in this environment, but the human horse interaction that is the thing that I'm so curious about, that when a horse is in a, in a riding stable, it can still have quality interaction and quality movement and quality time. Um, yeah. And is, is that available to all stables? Well, you have to look at the management and who's in charge, just like anything, yeah. you have good management and you have poor management. Um, but I think yeah. that there are ways that we can provide adequate enrichment for the horses, even in that environment. Um, and that yeah. we have to take each environment sort of uniquely and figure out how do we optimize that for the horses. Right. And I think a lot of more professional stables there, what they do is they have some dry lots, so they, they have a routine in the stable where a group of horses goes out in the morning and spends like an hour in a dry lot. Uh, usually they have hot walkers, so then they they go into a whole program of being turned out for a little bit, being ridden, going on a hot walker, maybe being hand walked. So um, I do know like the, the more professional stables try to take their horse just out of the stall like three, four, five times a day as uh, you know just to make sure that they move around enough and have that human human interaction and yeah get all their needs met that way as best as possible right um and the walkers that they have over there are they they're huge and they're quite impressive and they're they're basically like yeah. a moving stall um yeah. we don't see those typically in this country that you know when people think of a hot walker in the united states they think of the old carousel style with the horse's head tied up to a to a Right. right. So I just want to clarify that these hot walkers, the size of the, the, the circle is much, much bigger. And um, they're basically it's like um, screens that make a box stall and the horses walk, which is what they should be doing in nature is moving. And so, you know, um, I know that a lot of people have integrated hot walkers into their system to great effect, to great positive effect, because the horses are walking. Um, so. So, uh, okay, so 18, you got your first horse. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 18, got my first horse. Um, and I went on to take several working student positions because I knew, I knew when I was 17, this is what I want to do with my life. I, I wanted to be a trainer. Uh, for a brief period of time, I, I thought maybe I wanted to become a chef. I love cooking. Um, uh -huh. But then I'm like, do I want to spend my days in the kitchen or and ride for a hobby and maybe not ride all that much? Or do I want to sit on a horse and cook for a hobby? So that that one, that clearly was the decision. Um, so I went on and, uh, and uh, took whatever working student position I could find and uh, started teaching a bit. And I think I was 18 when I went to the uh, uh, like instructor certification uh, in Holland, which is a, a once a week education where uh, you basically spend the whole day with a group of people in the same class. And it was very hands on. We did theory in the morning. So we sat around a table and talked everything theory from what is a good shoulder in to how can you like, what do you need to look at for looking at their teeth? what is good normal locomotion of a horse how do the joints work how should they work all of that was touched on not not as deeply as i would have liked but everything was discussed um 
and then you were expected to have a job in the industry where you could further your own writing, you were expected to, to show, you were expected to teach. So what we did in school was in the morning we had the theory, in the afternoon uh, we rode and we got instruction or we were taught how to teach. So that was very interesting. That was a three-year uh, three year education and um, so once yeah, a week and, and while, every week so. for three years. Once a week. Yeah. Every week once for three week, years. Um, yeah, once a week for three years, but it was like uh, maybe twenty five weeks or something like that. I forget the details. It was not like a whole year long, but okay. But again, but even we, we still. were expected. Still, yeah, it was a, it was a decent education. Yeah, and so you bring up another really good point about the differences between the European system and the American system um, in that yeah. we have some certification programs for riding instructors, but we don't have a national program. Um, right. And so, you know, we wind up with uh, a, such a range of instruction from yeah. the person that like just kind of sat on a horse to somebody who's high level like you and the level of education is as varied as as it can be um which also yeah. in my opinion you know as i've been teaching for over 30 years um what i see is that this body and and lack of cohesiveness in our education winds up with uh riders that really uh, are not being well educated i guess is the way to put it yeah. Um, and, and it's difficult because in, you know, and this is again, what are the comparisons? Well, you're a small country. It's, it's actually yeah. not difficult to get everybody together or to create a national, pro how many people are in Holland? I can't remember now. Um, in the Netherlands, I've I forgotten what 17 million at this point. Right. Which is, uh, smaller than the DC area. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we keep contrasting sort of population and land mass. Um, and yeah. systems and I and yeah. that's the thing that I keep seeing is in a smaller country with a smaller land mass and a smaller population with also a, a much longer history of sort of a, a, a training system yeah. a, a unified training system and pretty yeah. much a, a limited focus of disciplines if you will in the beginning you know you had your military yeah. disciplines your dressage your show jumping your, your cross country um, yeah. you didn't have Western um, so that yeah. you could you could create a foundation much more simply than than here where you know somebody in the Midwest has a completely different background and focus with their horses than yeah. somebody on the East Coast um, but that said you know this kind of this kind of and I think that's one of the, the things for me that the webinars are I, I guess that's my you know my educator in me is that by creating these webinars I'm creating an education for people where they can at least start to learn that there's other options um, and yeah. start to explore that and um, you know there are a number of people that have gone from the United States over to Europe to do their training whether it's in Holland yeah. or Germany or the or UK um, because they have structured systems yeah you know and there's yeah. there's upsides like I used to go to Finland and I, I'll never I got to tell you this story because you'll get a kick out of it um, I went to Upaya which is the largest equine college in Finland it has two indoors and 250 horses and this oh, wow. is back in the 90s and um, they have two universities they only have five million people in Finland with two equine universities um, and they teach all kinds of things, but I was in the indoor with my my class and we were laughing because I had an exercise ball and the instructors from the university were outside and heard the laughter and had to come in and find out what was going on. There was laughter in the indoor. <laughs> we got in so much trouble, <laughs> you know, oh. so that was the flip side of it is that it was so rigid that there wasn't sort of yeah. the opportunity for fun and there's got to be a middle in here somewhere, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think Europe, every every tradition, there is so much uh, a military background, and I think it's changing now, but that, yeah, that's very much still, like, we must be serious about this because it's very, very important. And, of course, it's very important. But, yeah, I, I agree with you. We, we don't have to, we should remember that we do this because we love horses, first of all. 
Right. And um, and and I find also so many people now, um, like professionals in the world, and everybody that takes it so serious. I'm like, yes, I take my job very serious. I take my training very serious. But when it comes down to it, I get to play with horses for a living. And, <laughs> exactly. And I think that is right. And that's what we need to not forget. We we get to play with horses for a living. And and the more we we think of it with pl as play for the horses, the better it is for them also because. They don't understand that serious stuff. They they just want to have a good time. I think and that's one of the things that I met yes. you that I enjoyed because you are very you're um, you're very positive and up upbeat and curious and fun. I mean that's the yeah. that was kind of my impression and it really uh, you know there's been some really um, sad events in the dressage world with some of the the professionals um, over the past year um, where the pressures got to. to got to be too much and you know this is a sport and yeah. you know we have to keep that in mind that it is a sport and yes it might be our income and our livelihood but at the same time if if it becomes that heavy and that serious then you know we certainly know the horses are going to feel that that's going to be you know right really hard on that right i think that's an important thing to always remember because it doesn't fit with the nature of the horse that that serious drilling kind of mentality and i mean when i get serious for a horse show i i get like a little bit more intense maybe but i do try to keep the variation for my horses and i try to you know try to have a bit of a playful attitude so that they want to do the work and uh, and just as much as people get burned out of course the horses get burned out and that's i i, I try to always think to myself if for my horses, their time in the arena every day is not the most interesting part of their day, then I'm not doing it right. Because mm. I want them to be interested in the work. I want them to to want to work with me. And that's a hard one, of course, because sometimes you have to kind of work through issues or make them do things that are hard for them. But um, I, I try always to have their time in the arena be interesting and, and that they, if they can look forward to it, I don't know if they have that emotion, but that they look forward to it. To the work well when a horse just like a person when you learn to learn and you understand that it's a process and there's something interesting going to happen you get more engaged and so when you, you time you know i don't know about you but for me time disappears when i'm really engaged in something and then you look up and it's like oh it's three hours later and wow what what happened to the time yeah. because i was so involved in it and yeah. i think if we can present concepts to horses in a way that they feel themselves um in a way that is is in pleasing or enjoyable is kind of a weird word for them but you know you see horses as they develop they start to feel proud they start to feel like hey i'm i'm yeah. i'm badass right and that's what really yeah. makes a good show horse so yeah yeah so okay sure. so you, you went through this education in holland and then um did you did you stay there and train and show for a while or or was that when you transferred over to the states yeah. so uh, so I think, um, when did I move here? I think I was 26 or 27 when I moved here. So I had a number of years after my, my formal education and, uh, Reen, my original trainer, um, uh, was one of the teachers there. And after school, I started training with him every week. So I took one or two horses there every week and continued my education that way. And then um, the opportunity to train with Mr. Tedescu came about. So I went to Germany uh, once a week with one or two horses and I showed a little bit in Germany. Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, the, the first horse that I got, he became my young rider horse to kind of go back to that a little bit. He was, I was 18 when I got him and uh, he was doing third level when I got him. So in a couple of years, we, we trained him to do uh, pretty much pre Saint George level. No, when I look back at it, it's I was super proud of it back then. But now when I look back at it, I'm like, mm, should have should have done that a little bit better. But anyway, I I, I did that with you once. <laughs> yep, and I learned a lot from the horse. So after that, I got a couple younger horses that I uh, uh, eventually ended up also training up to Prix Saint George level. They did a little Piaf and Passage. They did a little bit of everything of the Grand Prix. So that was super fun to bring along uh horses that i started myself started them under saddle and taught them through all the levels uh and i think that's kind of as a continued education an important thing to do 
uh, as a professional for sure that you don't just know how to train upper level horses and the upper level movements but now how do you how do you start a young horse like how do you introduce the saddle how do you introduce the bridle how do you first get on them um, and I think if you've never done that it's it's a lack in your understanding of horses because you learn from them you learn what is a natural response and you learn how to deal with that and you learn how to actually truly train them so um, and two of those horses uh, I brought over to the United States eventually when they were, it must have been uh, probably around eight. Super Times was one of them. I, I didn't start Super Times on their saddle, but I bought him as a very young horse. He was going training level, kind of sort of on the bit, kind of sort of didn't want to buck me off anymore. So, uh, um, and he is one that, that eventually, um, showed international and he's now i want to say he's 22 or 23 and he just oh, wow. retired last year uh yeah i sold him to a canadian rider and uh amateur lady and she loves the horse and he's been sound and fit and competing um so that makes me really proud of the job that i've done with yeah. him that he's is so strong in the body that even up until a, a higher age 22 23 he was still competing and um yeah really just in good shape that's that's actually and, um, quite the testament because there's an awful lot of dressage horses yeah. that disappear, um, you know, early yeah. teens, and and yeah. to you know I think that longevity is one of the things that really is a testament to training that the horses are maintain good health, maintain fitness, maintain soundness, um, yeah. and that's a really good evaluation. So I just want to go back a little bit, and and um, not everyone knows who Mr. Theodorescu is. Um, and I believe, okay. so I just kind of, if you can give it, I, I met him, but he was, uh, quite old at that point and, um, mentally not as, yeah. um, present, but anyway, just, just talk about him a little, yeah. because he is one of the pillars, the icons in the German tradition. Yeah. He's, he's one of, he's one of Germany's greatest trainers, I think of the past century. Um, he was a, a riding master, which means I believe in Germany that you've had to have, uh, I want to say 50 horses in international Grand Prix competition. I don't know that you've had to have ridden them or be part of the training in some way. Um, so he, he really knew what he was doing. And currently his daughter, Monika Teodorescu, is the German team coach. Oh, uh, okay. So, and, and yeah, she's the German team coach at the moment. Um, George Teodorescu was in his day, I think he was born in, where was he born? I forget now. Some, somewhere, somewhere in the Eastern part of Europe, fled right. to Germany and, um, established his business there. Uh, he was himself an Olympic rider, uh, multi, uh, time Olympic coach for different countries. Uh, Monica has done, I think she's won three or four gold medals with the German team. So, and he's been her trainer all along. So he, uh, I also met him when he was older. He was uh, 80 years old when I started training with him. Oh, wow. And I know you said he was, yeah, he was 80 years old. He, um, he, I, I agree with what you said. He maybe wasn't a hundred percent super sharp, but in his lessons, he was on it. And um, I, I like to think that I got kind of the essence of what he believed was good riding because he did repeat himself quite a lot. Uh, like every week he had similar things that he really impressed on me. Um, and it was simple things like um, he, he would, take me aside and stop me and say in a very serious tone, always remember the horse has four legs. And I'm like, I was early twenties, right? I'm like, what does this old guy mean? Of course, of course a horse has four legs. But now that I start to think about it more, it's really, he said, you need to take all four legs of your horse in consideration and you need to take the entire body of the horse in consideration, no matter what you're doing. And he said, as, as a simple example, if we turn, we are standing on two legs, we can just turn around. Like we can just make a 180 degree turn, not even think about it. And if we think of turning that way of having two legs instead of four, 
you're never going to balance your horse correctly through a turn, for instance, or in a canter pirouette or in a shoulder in. So there was a lot of, a lot of simple things like that that really made an impression and um, that I think is, is very valuable. Like simple, remember that your horse has four legs. You know, um, I think that that is, um, when, you, when you look at these masters, they, they distilled it down to essence. And they distilled it down to simple. Yeah. And if we're not yeah. ready to to comprehend that, we usually need some age before you can comprehend what they're really talking about. Um, Absolutely. But it's back to basics. It's always back to basics. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And and so his lessons were were simple that way. They were they were good. He pushed me. Um, I was lucky enough to have a couple of really good horses to work with him and lucky enough that in that environment, I, uh, my lessons were always on Monday morning and um, I was lucky enough that I always rode after Monica Teodorescu with her last international horse, Whisper. And I saw that horse right after her, there was a, uh, a Russian horse named Balagur who was one of Russia's best horses at that point. I think he, he, he went to several WEGs and Olympics and whatnot. So he was always trained right before my lesson. So the cool thing was to see those top quality horses, like really some of the best in the world. And then there I showed up with my, you know, for me, really good horses, but in their mind, probably fairly simple horses. And the, the cool thing was he gave me the same, uh, the same energy, I was just as important. My horses were just as important, especially the horses were just as important uh, as any of the top horses. And I think that was another very uh, interesting thing. Every horse in that stable mattered as much as the next one. Like there was not, this is a good horse, so he matters more. This is not a good horse, so he matters less. Every horse really, truly mattered. And, um, and that was also, you know, to, to go back to the longevity of the horses, that was quite installed in me in, in all the stables that I've ridden at is that's our job. We need to make sure that our horses get healthier, stronger, that we add to their quality of life and that we add to their health and well-being through correct training. And at Teodorescu's, I saw that. I mean, they had their old horses out in the field and for people that remember Monica Teodorescu's older horses, uh, Grunox was one of them, which was her, I want to say her Barcelona Olympic horse uh, that she won team gold with. And he was probably in his late 20s, early 30s, still happy as a clam out there in the field and uh, looking still very healthy. So yeah, those, those experiences of going to that kind of stable was just amazing to see everything from young horses to Grand Prix horses and how how respectful they were to each and every one of them. Wow, that's really impressive. I, I remember seeing Whis really the, Whisper. The yeah, um, they, they were at um, the Academy. I went to the Academy for the Global Dressage Forum and um, uh, Mr. Okay. Theodor Eskew was there with Monica and, and Whisper and that horse had an amazing walk. It was just a mind-blowing walk. And yes. everybody was like, how are you going to collect this? Um, but obviously she, she did. Um, and you know, there's, there's so much value. People don't even realize how much value there is in watching a series of horses with a trainer and see that progression and development and shaping. Um, that it's, it's the kind of thing that's just in the background in your mind that you have an image of what that looks like because again so many people start out training their horses but they don't really know what it is they're searching for or where they're going yeah. and so uh, not that mistakes are bad because i think all mistakes are an opportunity to learn but it, it, sometimes you have to like undo three things because you focused on one thing because you didn't really know what the progression was and what the final product is going to look like and so yeah. by having the experience of watching training and watching horses develop um, and then working with your own horse, um, it, it gives you that sort of uh, um, guidepost, those landmarks, the uh, progressions, um, and you can understand why you're doing something here at a very basic level because you've seen where that's going to develop at an advanced level. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. 
So, so you wound up in the United States. Uh, yep. We're going to roll forward. And you, where did you wind up? What part of the United States? Uh, just outside of Richmond. Virginia. Uh, in so it was Virginia. Goswell. Goswell, Virginia. Yes. Okay. Somehow I thought you were in New Jersey. I don't know where I got that idea. So, yeah. So, so to kind of go through my, my time in the United States and how I ended up here. So we started in, in Doswell. Um, we were there for a couple of years. Um, relationship ended up not working out, basically. And I took a job with Catherine Haddad, who is one of America's top writers. And she is in, she is in the summers in New Jersey, winters in Florida. So that's how I ended up in New Jersey for a little while. Um, and went back and forth between New Jersey and Florida, and then ended up after a couple of years working for Catherine, staying in Florida for myself for a couple of years. Um, and then through a couple other areas, I stayed in North Carolina for a little bit, and now I'm, I'm back in Virginia. Um, and I have been for the past uh, two years. And right. I do have to say Virginia really is, is feels like home. Oh, great. Um, oh, that's good really to hear. It's the state that feels <laughs> most like where I want to be. Yeah. Yeah. It's a Florida, uh, you know, Florida is an interesting place. The weather in the summertime is certainly not ideal for working with yeah, horses. No. Um, um, and I have, I have traveled there many times to teach. And I always say, I know when I'm going to land and I know when I'm going to take off, but I have no idea what's going to happen in between. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, um, so when you were with Catherine Haddad, uh, obviously you were training and teaching and showing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and yeah. Um, who did you who were you riding at that point? Because there's some ribbons so hanging up behind Catherine's... you. So. <laughs> Sorry. There's some oh, yeah, ribbons, the ribbons hanging yeah. up behind you. So I know there was some yeah. showing in here. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So at Catherine's, I, um, I brought one of my own horses. He was uh, five years old when I started working there. And um, so that was my only horse that I owned. And my job was, I was her, I was her assistant trainer. So I rode pretty much everything except her top horses. Uh, I rode them when she was out of town. Uh, so I had a couple really good horses there. One horse was Davidor that I showed um, international in the small tour, or, or into, yeah, international. So we went to Sargadis, we went to Devon, um, brought him up to intermediate two level. Uh, so that was one of my horses on my list. And then I had another horse called Patronus that was my Grand Prix horse there. Um, he just did national Grand Prix, but that was a very good learning opportunity. Uh, so those were my two horses that I showed. Uh, the five-year-old that I brought along with me, he was probably going about first, second-ish level when I first started working there. And in a couple of years, we brought him up to pretty much doing everything for the pre St. George. And then he, he was sold eventually because um, we, we had a client and I needed the money. And um, yeah. So, yeah, so, you know, that's how he goes. He was a good horse and he still is. And um, um, yeah, so those were the two or the two main horses that I showed there. And then I rode whatever horses I, I had to ride. There were usually five or six every day on my list. And um, that that was kind of the job there. Yeah, you know, and I think this is one of the things that people don't necessarily understand or appreciate when you're a trainer and a professional that you know, you're bringing your horses along, but they are always for sale um, because yeah. that's part of the business and part of the livelihood. And so it's, yeah. it's really difficult because you have to get attached in order to develop the horse and then you have yeah. to be willing to let them go. Um, yeah. and, and that's, you know, I, I realized really early on that I was not in the business of buying and selling that I don't have the heart for it. <laughs> and it's, right. you know, it, it, you have, but when you get at that level, that's, that is part of the part of the job, um, yeah. and I just had Reese Colfer on the other day, and she she also did something really interesting as a professional because she created syndicates in order to buy a couple of the horses that she has trained and shown, um, mm -hmm. because these top horses can be very expensive, and yeah. you know there's 
there's such the worry, and this is this is always sort of the balance. It's such a delicate balance between, you know, the value of the horse, the syndicate if you're involved with that, the health of the horse, and the well-being. And you know, how do we balance turnout, safety, performance? You know, all of these balls that you have to juggle to keep this horse in top condition and top mental health, yeah. um, while at the same time you know, developing them and possibly selling them or, you know, yeah. man keeping them safe. And so can you talk about that? Because it's not a simple thing. Right. So well, uh, for me right now with my own horses, I'm a very strong believer that they need a lot of tur turnout. So here at Jenny and Melinda, where my horses are, they go out either the whole day or the whole night, and they're just expected to be horses. Um, and I find that that is really um, the best way to keep them. For the horses that I have currently, mentally they're the best if they are out for an extended period of time. And I find also the risk of injury really, if, if it's just part of their routine, um, they don't get injured, knock on wood, um, so quickly. If you keep them in their stall and they get an hour of turnout a day and it's very careful and they're not allowed to run and they're not allowed to actually be horses, then I find they injure much quicker. Because uh, I've done I've done both. I mean, I've, I've done the typical dressage, like don't turn them out. And if they start running, they have to come in and then they just get hand walked. And, and, and I don't think that that is the way to do it anymore. I, I feel much better now that my horses are just a normal turnout. Um, you know, exceptions are always sure. there. Uh, if you really have one that is just too stupid and always pulls shoes and just can't deal with turnout, yeah, then you figure out a different situation. But right now my horses go, I think they go out around five or six in the evening and come back in around 7 30 8 o'clock in the morning if it rains they have running sheds that they can stand in if they don't want to stand in the running shed they just get wet and they usually come in very muddy very wet very dirty <laughs> and very happy so very happy. um yeah and so i i i am quite a big believer in that and that's how i how i will want to keep my horses in the future as well you know, but you bring up a really good point that when we try to contain them, we actually cause more, you know, greater risk of injury because um, yeah. because we're not allowing them the, what they need. It's like taking little kids and sticking them in a classroom and telling them they have to sit and be very quiet and just pay attention. And then, of course, yeah. all hell breaks loose. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, that doesn't work. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, so, so someone's asked a question and they want to, they wanted to know if you could discuss the difference between classical dressage as opposed to competitive dressage. Sure. Um, first of all, I think it's the same thing. I think um, the way that I look at it is I train my horses at home to be good, fit, healthy, happy athletes. Um, and I think the levels that we have here in the United or all over the world, but the levels are designed to bring horses along. Now, I think maybe the difference is how I look at it and how maybe some other dressage trainers look at it, I don't know, is some people look at the test and say, okay, what is the level that I want to compete at? What does my horse need to know? And then they start training what is in the test. I try to look at it the other way. I try to look at the horse. I try to see what does the horse need. How can I get um, my horse stronger, fitter, more supple? What exercises does the horse need as an individual? And then what is the level that fits with the education of the horse? Not the other way around. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think uh that is often overlooked like why do we for instance do a leg yield why do we do a shoulder in why do we teach the flying change or a counter canter or piaf and passage there's a reason why we use these exercises and their their purpose is to train the horse and that has been instilled in me from a very young age that dressage is there for the horse the horse is not there for dressage it's supposed to train the horse 
to be a better being, to be a better worse, mentally and physically, to really truly develop. And then once you get to a level where you say, hey, I want to show this off, then you can go to the horse show. So I think that is a little bit the difference. I, I don't like people that say I'm doing classical dressage and I don't want a horse show because that's not classical. That's, I, I don't think that that's, um, the one doesn't have to exclude the other in my opinion. Well, and I think you brought up a really good point in that the purpose of the test is to have an evaluation of your level of progress. Or, or in my opinion, that's what it's supposed to be, as opposed to, you know, score chasing or something like that. And, yeah. um, and I think that that, um, again, it's the focus that, um, you know, I know people that ride, and I think of it as like riding in the closet. I have a, I, I use the example, I had a friend who played piano, he used to play for himself, he played in the closet, basically, and we arranged for him to have a performance, and it was, it was like, let see the quality of your work when it's presented to a larger audience and I think yeah. that if we think of presenting our horse to a judge yeah. to, to evaluate and obviously showing is a whole nother animal in terms of the skill set required to ride the test accurately be able to handle the show nerves be able to do all the things that yeah. that's a whole nother skill set in addition to the training and I, and when we yeah. kind of lump them together, I think that's when we get in trouble because, you know, I've seen many people that, you know, they've ridden at home and then think they can go to a show without actually learning the skill set of a show. And it's another skill set. Yeah, very true. Very um, true. And so, um, and the other thing, and this is, this is one of my issues that I have with courses in general is that in almost every other sport, we have a standard of what is good. In golf, there's a yeah. standard of what good mechanics are, and because it's you and a ball, and where the ball winds up is clearly where you hit it. Um, there's a direct relationship yeah. between the person's activity and the result. But with horses, yeah. we have we don't have we haven't concluded what this standard really is. Um, there's so many right. different concepts on what good rider position is, good function is, um, and I and it's I, until we come to some kind of an agreement of what good is, we're going to maintain, we're going to retain all these different positions and assumptions, you know. And I don't want to yeah. bring up certain training systems, but there are certain training systems that are clearly they produce an extravagant result but may not be yeah. the best for the horse um right but until we have a way to uh to ethically evaluate and like i said all other sports it's gravity right you either hit the ball and it goes in the hole or you hit the ball and it's gone somewhere else but because we have another yeah. living being we can't we, you know it's a very different standard and what people consider good is all over the map I mean, it's, you go across yeah. the disciplines, makes it extremely yeah. difficult. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And I think, I think, you know, judges play a big role in that also. And I think the judges education is getting better and better. Um, and I think that is very important. And, and what I do see more and more is that we, as a culture, do value, um, the training systems that are beneficial to the horse. Like if you look at a horse like Vallegro, for instance, that was clearly a happy athlete and extravagant, but not to a point that it was unnatural. It was just really, really good addition to the natural talent of that horse. It was really developed in its own natural talent. And uh, I, I think that is a very positive development in the sport of the past. Yeah, yeah. and ago. and hopefully we will continue. I, I'm gonna go grab my battery because uh, my um plug because my battery's getting low. Keep talking. Okay. I'll be right okay. back. <laughs> um, yes. So I think that is a very positive development in the sport right now that um, we see horses being trained and developed within their natural abilities. Um, and and again, that is a, for me what is so important that I take the horse who he is, what he is, can I improve on his strengths, but, and can I, through correct training, 
prevent injuries in the areas of the body maybe where there are some weaknesses or um, um, yeah, well, and that, I truly through my whole way of strengthening my wars. Oh, are you there? No, I'm almost, I'm almost here. You. I just, um, but, okay. but the injuries, that brings up a really good point that our quality of training, yeah. um, the, the soundness of the horse, if I can get the plug to stay in the hole. Yeah. There we go. Okay, I think I got it. Usually I'm okay, but oh, there we go. We're charging. Awesome. Um, and that's just the, that's the testament, I think, is the soundness of the horse and longevity. I think that's yeah. one of the, uh, and granted, horses are horses, and they may injure themselves. But, um, you know, yeah. when talking to a lot of these veterinarians about, like, suspensory injuries and deep digital flexors, those are wear and tear over time. They, unless there's a trauma, that is not happening acutely. That's happening over long period of uh, dysfunction. And then suddenly I, the tendon just can't hold on anymore. And so, you know, this yeah. is where um, I, I think that is a, is a good evaluation of the, uh, obviously the mental health of the horse, but the physical health of the horse and the longevity is really a, um, uh, something to really yeah. take into consideration. Yeah. And I, I think uh, uh, for me, that is where your sure foot paths come in to really uh to really look at how so first of all when i put my horses on the paths what i find interesting is look at the different indentation if there is any like are they standing on both feet evenly and that gives you already a whole lot of information of how the mechanics of each limb is basically functioning or not functioning optimally um and because I've, I've really kind of this week thought about what do the surefoot pads do for me personally? And I think what it makes me do is look even more critically at the mechanics of my horse. Like, are their knees level? Are they bending through each joint evenly? Is there a smooth, um, a smooth way of using their gait? Or is there an interruption somewhere? Is there a joint that doesn't bend as much or that overflexes maybe? Um, so, so I think that is what we need to look at, not just how extravagant does my horse move, how high pick they, do they pick their knees up, but are they, because we all love horses with yaks and we all love a big front wheel, but is that because the horse is actually truly engaged in their body, taking their weight back to their hindquarters. Are the hindquarters actually working correctly or are they kind of stiffen their hips and do the 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 hawks get the, the brunt of it? Because um, I, I believe that if we train correctly, we train their muscular system in such a way that we protect their joints and their tendons and ligaments, which are more vulnerable from getting injured. That should be what we're trying for anyway. So it's a matter of always looking at how is the bony construction of my horse functioning and is the muscular system of my horse actually supporting that or am I asking too extravagant of a gait for my horse and like in an extended trot if they really fling their front legs like is that do they fling it and do they kind of snap their their leg or is it a smooth loose balanced way of moving their their body and I think that is still maybe sometimes where as a, as a simple example in the extended trot where we need to look at like because we don't want toe flicking we don't want flinging legs we want a smooth um logical extension of the gait and and so and, we have um, a couple of pictures should i should i pull up some yeah. of the pictures okay um yeah yeah let's look at it Um, I just pulled up this one as the first one. Yeah, so this is my horse, Philemon. He is, um, he is now 10 years old. This was his very first pre-St. George competition. And um, so when I look at this picture, I think overall, he, he's a horse that has a lot of front leg action. Uh, he likes to make his front very big. But if I'm looking very critical at this picture right now, 
he is a little bit dropped in his back. I would like it to that he closes up a little bit more behind. So just to kind of look at the whole biomechanics that way, he should have pushed up in his withers a bit more. If I look at this critical, I think he lifts his front leg a little bit more than what he truly pushes up in the withers. But what I like about this picture is kind of the the evenness of bend in both his hind legs and his front legs. That looks very quite even to me. Um, this is a horse that, like I said, by nature, he wants to fling his front legs around quite a bit and he's a little slow in the hind leg. Um, so that has been for me kind of where I've been using the surefoot pads with him to, to make a better brain to hind leg kind of connection. And um, he's also I think one I worked that with you with this horse once, quite, didn't I? Didn't, didn't I? You, didn't yes. I work with this horse with you in the indoor one time and we, you were mounted and we yes. did surefoot with him. Yeah, it's such a cool horse, this horse yeah. though. I, very smart horse, very yeah. quick. Yeah. Very smart. A yeah. Fun guy. Very smart, very intelligent. And he's really what you said. He's the kind of horse that goes, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all that. Like he knows how cool he is. Yes. Especially and he was, like in the show environment, you can, you can tell by his face, he's like, yeah, man, we got it. <laughs> and that's how he felt. Yeah. Um, um, and he was very quick to figure out the surefoot pads, and he was very interested. He's a quick-minded yeah. horse, I think is how I would call him. So, very yeah. fun horse. All right. So I'll yeah. get his very, very much so. Let's see. Let's see. Um, and this is another picture of him. Let's get back. Yeah, I love this picture. This is on an eight meter voltage after a shoulder and right before a half pass. Um, here, did I? he felt super in this picture. It, it, uh, I remember this circle really well. He's just one that really takes my seat super nice. And again, here I really like the evenness of the bend in the hind leg and the front leg. And it, it looks to me very balanced. And I think we got an eight for this voltage. Well, you've got your parallelograms going here with your your yeah. diagonal pairs, right? Yeah. And the evenness of height of this front foot to this back foot. Yeah, yeah. And I think the other thing that is quite clear in this picture is like he's really bending through the whole length of his body. Um, you can pretty much see where that outside hind leg is going to land is right in the track of the outside front leg. So he's not swinging out. Yeah, he's, he's not land right here. He's just this whole picture for me is really I love this picture and not to not because it's me I would have loved it if it's somebody else also and I do love it because this horse is just well awesome. it's such an interesting picture because rarely do you see a, a horse on an eight meter volte in a photograph it's not a common yeah. picture yeah. and so yeah. you know at first it's like wow wait a second you have to wrap your rein around this is not how you know how we typically we typically depict on a on a diagonal line or a straight line so it's so interesting to you can see the curve of his body but also to see how how straight he is on that circle and as you say this is really going to land in the print of the forefoot yeah. so he's really on two tracks very impressive yeah. very yeah. expressive really, really balanced. Yeah. yeah 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 so let's see we've got a question let me just see uh so so someone is asking what approaches what approaches work with a horse with submission issues? And, and um, what, I, what I find interesting about that is the concept of, of issues with submission, I, I guess is what, um, yeah. so maybe you can talk about that a bit. Sure, sure. I think first we need to then kind of touch on what, what does submission really mean? Um, for me, submission is, um, basically that my horse has decided that it wants to work with me. So it's not submission that I am overpowering the horse or I'm making the horse or whatever. So I, for me, it's like my, I present my horse with a situation where it's attractive to the horse to actually work with me. Um, now there's different ways, of course, to go about that. And, and, and honestly, what I like to do a lot, if I really have a difficult horse, I remember one horse that I had, a number of years ago, he was three years old. Yeah, he was three years old. And he came to me 
And if people say, yeah, we've been lunging him, uh, he goes well on the lunge line, but we haven't ridden him yet. Can you, can you start him under saddle? And I'm like, sure, can be done. So I remember I take him into our indoor uh, that day because it was a very rainy day and it was, I didn't want to turn him out yet because the fields were a little slippery. And I'm like, you know, let me just move him around a little bit on the lunge line that he can stretch his legs a little bit. And then tomorrow we see. So I took him into the indoor, the horse comes into the indoor um runs into me with his shoulder so i elbow him out of the way he turns at me he rears up strikes out and of course i smack him with the lunge whip like hey that is not allowed he turns his butt kicks out and continues to run for 15 minutes so to talk about lack of submission that horse is the first one that comes to mind and um so i got home that day and i'm like i, I don't know what to do with this horse i i just i don't think i can do it and luckily at that point, I had a girl working for me that was really quite skilled in natural horsemanship. So I said to this girl, I'm like, unless you have some tools that we can use, what I, I don't know that I can actually handle this horse. So the next day we took him in a rope halter and a carrot stick and his training actually started. So for really difficult horses like that, I always first want to make sure that the groundwork makes sense. Like, how do they lead? Are they truly okay with being led or is there already some uh dominance uh unbalanced that way and with this horse that was very much the case like he would always try to push into you he would always try to dominate the situation so i spend a lot of time with that particular horse on a rope halter in a round pen doing a lot of natural horsemanship work um and that is still what i do with my horses and that's that's where it starts for me. Like, how are they on the ground and are they truly respectful? And do they find me not just interesting, but in a respectful way? Like, so that's, that's from a, just a plain training perspective where I would go is a lot of groundwork. And then that should carry over once you have established a relationship with the horse where they do respect us as the leader. And we've created a sense of harmony that way that should then also carry over to under saddle and I think under saddle then it becomes a matter of being disciplined that when we ask a question the question has to be fair um, the horse needs to be able to mentally understand the answer and physically be able to give us the answer and if we can answer all those three questions so if I if I give an A to my horse I ask myself is my horse mentally capable of understanding, physically capable of doing this, and is it fair? And if I can say yes to all three, then it's a matter of sticking to your guns and saying, listen, when I ask the question, I must get an answer, and no is not an answer in that point, in that moment. And then the more your horse goes, oh, that was actually not too hard of a question, um, like just simply move off the leg or move a little sideways for the leg or at that kind of simple starting and then if you keep your questions fair and the horse can e easily answer it physically maybe mentally they have a block because they don't want to be told what to do but then the more they um, figure out that we are actually really fair to them then over time you build more and more willingness to work because the work is easy enough for them and then it Thank becomes in a way can we Sorry, sorry, but you bring up such a good point about it, is it a fair question? And, uh, you know, I, yesterday yeah. on my webinar, we were talking about shutdown horses and the fact that so many horses are confused. They're either afraid, confused, yeah. or in pain. And so we yeah. assume that you know that, you know, you've done this before. How many times have you heard that? Well, you've done this before, so you should be able to, but the, the horse, sees yeah. the circumstances different. And so I think so often we yeah. assume that we have asked a fair question or we assume that yeah. they should know how to answer it instead of really yeah. stopping and checking, are we asking a fair question? And I think that's such an, like, and can yeah. we break it down to make sure? Yeah. Um, yeah, and so I, I think you, you, you had a very good point there with, uh, is my horse in pain? Is it dis is it in discomfort? So if what I would say, if you have major submission issues, a couple things you need to make sure of first, is my horse actually sound? Has the vet seen it recently? 
have you done flexions? Is my horse sound to do the work that I want to do? Then second of all, does my tack fit? Is my saddle not the issue? Does my bridle fit? Uh, does the bit fit with the anatomy of my horse's mouth? Uh, all these things. Is my bridle not accidentally creating a pressure point right behind their ears and their pole? I think nowadays we have nice bridles that are padded behind the crown piece and the, the strap of the nose band is not right behind the ears anymore. It's all nicer padded, but older bridles where you have the nose band run underneath the crown piece of your bridle and it, it that creates a pressure point right behind their, behind their ear. So if you have a horse that has trouble relaxing their pole, is your bridle not the issue? Um, and of course, a bit is only as good as the hands of the rider, but um, make sure that your, your gear is not causing any submission or that your horse is not like what you said, physically in pain. And therefore, no matter what you ask, the question is not fair. Right. Um, and I and that and I think so often um, we fail to stop and actually ask these simple questions. Um, by the way, Dr. Clayton yeah. is going to be on my webinar uh, this month, and we're going to talk about bit and bridle fit. So we've got Dr. Clayton oh, wonderful. to talk about that. Um, and wonderful. and the other yeah, I'm really excited. But the other thing when I when I read this question about submission, you know, one of the things that comes up for me is that having done surefoot for eight years now so often the, the, there's two things. One, the horse is not in balance. He's not in balance either mentally, emotionally, mm -hmm. or physically. And the other thing is, does he feel safe? And so often what we consider yeah. a submission pr problem is actually that the horse is feeling threatened in some way, whether it's pain, fear, confusion, yeah. out of balance. And so they're, they're not submissive because to be submissive, one yeah. has to feel secure and you cannot uh, yeah. allow yourself to be submissive if you're not feeling secure. Which brings me to this horse that, that I'm gonna pull up this picture because this horse has a story. Yes. Um, yes, yeah, so this is a wonderful horse. Uh, this was this horse's first competition in the Intermediate two, so almost Grand Prix level. Um, he is by nature not a very secure horse. He really had to learn through a lot of work, a lot of groundwork to really truly trust me. And now he's he's with me 100%. He's he's on my side. He, I want to say this horse really loves me. He's the kind of horse now when he's even when he's all the way in the back of his field when he hears me, and I usually um, I have the luxury of living right across the stable, so I usually in the evening walk my dog around and check on my horses, and he'll he'll hear me in the in the dark, like nine o'clock at night, in the dark, he'll hear me walk by his paddock and he comes trotting up to the fence, like pretty much every day, no fail. So I really, this horse has really learned to trust me, really learned to, to value my leadership, if you will. And um, yeah, he's, he's been quite interesting. And he's a, he's a horse you worked with also, Wendy. Um, this was one of the first horses I think that we worked with together, Patrick, because um, yeah. you you said to me that you you were having difficulty with this horse, and so we started with the surefoot pads. And uh, you go ahead and tell the story because you tell it better than I do. That was that was <laughs> a different one. The very first horse that we worked with was a different horse. That was a mare, oh, okay. and she oh, that's very right. opinionated. Yeah. Yeah, this horse we worked with and we had him in the outdoor arena here and I wanted to kind of get your take on him to, to and, and to work with the surefoot pads because he sometimes is not quite connecting his brain to his body the way that I, that I want it. And um, you worked with him a little bit and we tried to put him on the pads and he kind of freaked out. He was like, I, I don't know what I'm standing on and I'm out of here. So you actually did a whole lot of... Uh, uh, T-touch kind of stuff and get him more connected in his body and in his brain. And I've kind of continued that. I, I, you know, I'm nowhere near any skill level that you have or knowledge level that you have. But for me, what really, what I took away from that session with you is be there with the horse and just feel, just feel where he is in his body, in his mind, and just touch him and see what kind of reactions you get. And I found that super fascinating to just put my hands on the horse without any 
expectation other than feeling what kind of feedback I get from the horse. And I think that is maybe also an interesting thing to talk about submission is if we want the horse to be our partner, we need to present ourselves as their partner. And that is partly what changed this horse a little, yeah, quite a bit actually, that I just said, listen, I have no expectation, but let me touch your neck, let me touch your shoulder, let me touch your hind leg, let me just kind of feel what kind of feedback I get. And I found with him certain spots I touched and he got more tense, other spots I touched and he got more relaxed. And what I ended up doing is go from the spot that I touched him where he was relaxed to a spot where he was more tense back to the relaxed until I could touch him in more places and have the more relaxed feedback. And it was not that he was tense and he was freaking out, but it wasn't quite as soft to the touch. And so over time, I I reintroduced the surefoot pads with him again, and now he can stand on them, and he's still a little worried about it, but he stands on them. And he's like, oh, I think, I think I can give this a try. I think this is a good thing. And uh, the interesting thing with him is that he'll stand on the pads, and he actually starts to relax and gets a little distracted, and then all of a sudden he looks, and he goes, oh, my God, I'm standing on these pads, and then he still has a bit of a, a panic reaction to them. But the cool thing is now that I can bring him back and say, listen, we just go back. And he's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, we can do this. So um, what the what the Surefoot Pats helped me with with this horse a lot is just really take a more critical look at, um, like, how is his body reacting to things and how much is he connecting his brain to his body and and what is the true feedback that I'm getting from him? Because he's not, he's quite a, um, an introvert. So his reactions are, are not big. You have to look for them. You have to pick up on the small signals like holding an ear different or breathing slightly different or moving a still in a relaxed way or all those little signals that um, make the horse understand that I, that I see him as a creature. I think it. Uh, I've been following a uh, a natural horsemanship guy on on social media for for a while. Warwick Schiller is his name. And oh, Warwick! Was, oh, yeah. <laughs> he's wonderful, and he just recently talked about Ray Hunt and with a quote that he had: uh, um, "If they they know when you know and they know when you don't." And he talked exactly about these things, like they know when you see that they're worried because you, you like if they turn their ear a certain way you know with that specific horse like oh that means x y and z and if you know then you know and that is partly what you said they need to trust us but then with very difficult horses like like this one was a, was a little bit of a, a heart not to crack and i'm still working on that every day to make sure that he knows that i'm there with him that i see him as how he is and that he doesn't have to put me on the list to worry about. Yeah, and you that you bring up so many good points here because I remember when I met this horse, he he felt like he was he didn't know where his feet were. He didn't have ground. Yeah. He he wasn't and yeah. so he couldn't stand still in the beginning if I recall. He was moving moving yeah. moving. And so yeah. when we we started with the pads, but I realized pretty quickly that that it he didn't and that reaction that like standing on the pads and then the startle oh my god I'm standing on a pad because he actually didn't recognize his own feet on the surface um, and yeah. these horses they're out there and they can definitely benefit from surefoot but there's such a different process than the average horse that we see that you put on a pad and then immediately licks and chews and lets down and breathes inside these horses you have to pick up on those really subtle small signals of that ear and that eye and it's like yeah. let them move off don't hold them because they're yeah. not connected to the ground they're not connected in their body and they're not feeling secure and we misinterpret yeah. that as bad behavior yeah we misinterpret it instead of insecurity and lack of body awareness as my horse doesn't respect me or my horse is difficult or my horse is not submissive and so you yeah. know it's that's the thing that with surefoot i I've, i keep seeing it over and over again that we label these horses um but we're missing what the issue is for the horse 
You know, we're missing that the horse yeah. isn't feeling secure. We're missing that he doesn't feel his body. We're missing that he's not grounded. We're missing that he's in pain or that he's confused. And we label it as, yeah. you know, he should know better. Um, yeah. And when we can let go of that, uh, that aspect of ego and say, wait a second, what yeah. is my horse trying to show me? And then, yes. and then, like you said, just placing your hand on it and not with no expectation. What can this horse accept my touch? So there's a lot of these horses that when yeah. you get there, you realize you've been blowing through all that and just making them stand there. But when we really step yeah. back, then suddenly the horses go, oh, you mean you're going to listen? You're going to recognize the signal that I've been trying to, you know, yeah. and um, and suddenly they start to to respond rather than react and start to, and then we yeah. can help them. And the bottom line is we want to help them, but we can't help them if we yell at them, you know. Right, yeah. They're, they're a flight yeah. animal. And the other thing that um, is so different is that as people, and this is one of the things that I think the pandemic has been really helpful for. Um, and the other day I went into a store and there were people there, even though the sign said wear a mask, there weren't people wearing masks. And my antennas instantly went up and I looked around and I saw these people not wearing a mask. And my reaction was, I'm not safe. And so I could not yeah. stay in the store. I had to leave. Well, that's what horses feel like yeah. all the time. That is their nature. Yeah. They're all the time going, yeah. am I safe? Am I safe? And how can I submit if I don't feel safe? I can't because I'm too worried about there's yeah. a threat here that I have to react to. And when, when we yeah. can provide them with the safety that in the herd, you know, the sandwich, the horses want to be in the middle. They want somebody else to stand there and be the one in charge and somebody else to clean up the back end. And the other ones rest in the yeah. middle. Well, if we can provide that, and this is Sharon Wilsey talks about this all the time. If we can provide that safety of, I'll, I've got your back. Let me help you. I'll take care of this for you so that they can feel safe. Then these ideas of submission take on a very different meaning and a very different understanding. It's allowing us to do that job for them, to be the watcher for them, to yeah. look out for them and to care for them. And then they can let that role go because they have the sense of safety. And I, I think that we have um, that horse of yours, that one that he just, I, you know, I, he didn't know where his body is in space, quite frankly, is yeah. I think what we talked yeah. about. And it's really, you know, yeah. and those horses are not going to change overnight. Those horses are going to take patience and time and quiet work until they can yeah. they can feel where they are because if they don't know where they are then they don't know where we are in relation to them and then yeah. everything's scary yeah. yeah yeah very true yeah and, and it's been uh, it's been a fascinating process with this horse yeah and these been, are the like ones said, that teach us the most right <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah they challenge us every day to yeah, reevaluate the way we approach things and what we're thinking and 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 to look for other other avenues and to crawl outside our boxes and ask other questions. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, Patrick, this has I have just thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. This has just been just fabulous. And you know, I, I like I said, when we met, we I really didn't know much about you. I just I just right. knew good things about the people that have worked with you and how much they admire you and respect you. And so um, this has been such a pleasure to get to know you uh, on another level and to hear about your training philosophy and your background, um, because I think it's so important for us to, uh, you know, keep that in mind that, that you know, um, if we don't love what we're doing and if we don't acknowledge the horse, then why are we doing it? why are we doing it yeah very true yep um and so i want to thank you so much for being my guest today i'm really looking forward to Absolutely. seeing you in person again and working with your horses again um me too me yeah. too so and it's been um, wonderful I'm, being on thank you so much for having me oh it's a pleasure it's a pleasure okay so um thank you everybody for joining us it's been another fascinating webinar of course i just love interviewing my guests and getting to know the background information. 
for me, it's really fun. Um, tomorrow, we're going to do Surefoot Introduction to Surefoot Equine Stability Program in French with Catherine Wyckoff. Um, so if you have any French speakers and they've been curious about Surefoot, make sure they tune into our webinar tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Thank you all for joining me. Thank you again, Patrick. Just remember, you can see this in all of my webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. And just have a wonderful day. And uh, enjoy your horses. Bye. Bye.